Good morning to everyone here at Halliburton United Church and Nick and Karen and those joining us online and to later on to hear the message. You may want to hear it later or replay it later on in the week. All the joy that the second week in Advent brings. As we count down to the birth of Christ again, the days continue their drive to the shortest day of the year. For me, and I'm sure for many of you, the shorter days are really short. Um, and it's the Christmas lights, the smiles of people, Christmas coming that helps make them better. The Christmas, the brighter days ahead, we know that Christmas and the days starting to get longer are, are very close together. And those days that start to get longer tend to bring us joy. It's hard to feel joyful sometimes on these dark and gray days. We must not give up hope, as we learned last week in our first Advent candle, because today we're going to light a second one, and as we get closer to Christmas, when we light the Christ child. So we'll call upon Sharon and her grandson to come up and light Josh to light the candle. Okay. Today we light the candle of peace, knowing that Jesus alone can make us feel at rest in his chaotic world. He calms our hearts as we await his second coming. In Philippians 4, Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in, G in Christ Jesus. May God grant us peace as we wait for Christ's glorious return. Thank you. Will you please join with me in our opening prayer? In this season of prophecy, promise, and preparation, we come to be renewed and refreshed. We come to be inspired by stories of a Messiah who will change the world and change us. Lord, we pray, give us ears to listen for words of hope and peace, promise and challenge. Give us open minds and open hearts so that we might receive the blessings you have in store for us in this season of waiting. We worship you, our God, the one who brings all things to fulfillment, through Jesus, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Thanks, Leslie. Morning, everybody. You braved the roads. It was a little bit icy and dicey, I found, going to Inglesby this morning. I was out. The part on our parking lot is terrible. Uh, Diane was coming. She got here. She put her feet out of the car, turned around, and went home, <laughs> which is sad. But we uh, we didn't get enough sand put on there, except for what Craig put out. Um, yeah, um, I would like to reiterate some of the announcements. Maybe um, uh, let's see. So next week is our third Sunday in Advent. Cool as normal. Then the week after that is Christmas Eve day. So that's the 24th. We're not having a morning service that day. So there's no morning services. Um, much to Melissa's chagrin, 
<laughs> One less. <laughs> uh, but we will having a service th that night, and uh, we're we're hoping to have a quite a bit of musical stuff going on. I do have uh, Carl Dixon coming, so <laughs> and uh, what, what's uh, what's Renee's son's name? Tommy Griffith, who sang in Sound of Music. Is it, how old would he be? Twelve. So he's like a preteen. Pre pre uh, tween, so he's a, a great singer, and uh, I've asked Craig if he could dream up some hornage to go with it. <laughs> yeah. Craig, Craig, he's in his 80s. <laughs> Looking good. <laughs> and me, I don't know, whoever else. So, uh, and there may be others. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, so please come, and uh, we will stream that live as well. So this is the first time we've done a live Christmas Eve service since 2019. And they do say COVID is still buzzing about merrily. So just be aware, be safe. Some people, you know, it's not a bad idea to keep wearing a mask. In fact, we recommend it. <laughs> um, and the next week, which is the last day of the year and the last Sunday of the year and the last day of Inglesby United Church, we will be having one service there at 10 o'clock. So please come um, to just wish folks well to celebrate that church and to, to worship together. So that's, uh, uh, that's the last Sunday of the month. And there will be a lunch after. So there'll be lots, some of you are involved with the food, the food and all three churches are, are going to get together. Uh, some of them will be once Lynn gets finished with you. <laughs> um, so we got 20, a, lot of, a, lot, a little bit more than usual concurrent viewers and devices, 21 devices out there. Uh, ben Laws are saying hi from Sweden. And if we think it's dark here, can you imagine how much... <laughs> yeah, they, they have less light. This is further north. Jan Tedford did not come out from Blair Hampton. Peggy's here. Uh, she's got a cold. She's not coming out. Paul Cornish celebrating their son Chris's, Chris's 50th birthday. Born on Christmas Day in 73. Home from L.A. for an early Christmas. He's also, I don't know if you knew this, but he's engaged to getting married in April. Um, and uh, happy 50th, Chris. That's Jan Tiffith. Jim Roberts, Jim and Donna, Lisa Harrison, Joy Cooper, and she's with, at the Cornishes. Well, there's a whole lot of stuff that you don't want to know, but I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> Randy and Arlene Birch, they're up at Kinesis Lake. Alan and uh, Sharon and Alan Galt. Uh, Chris Porter says good morning. <laughs> morning, Chris. <laughs> Uh, Cheryl Ruth, and happy birthday, uh, almost. And uh, Barb Peel, who goes by Halliburton 11. So if, if you don't know the codes, you wouldn't know. <laughs> Morning one and all. Okay, let's, uh, let's uh, enjoy a little bit of uh, music ministry from the West.
<laughs> Thanks, Melissa. I like those cool medieval Madonna pictures. Yeah. Um, okay, we're going to uh, sing uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Don't rush off because I want to play guitar with it. <laughs> I'm not all better. I'm better. Not all. I think that's better pick. Um, yeah, so uh, I basically can't. Scotty, Scotty Lee got me to go over the canoe and play some guitar as a studio musician for children recording little Christmas songs with the Bill Lit. So that was pretty cool. But uh, now if I can play guitar at canoe, I probably can play it somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's stand. <laughs> my sheet of instructions. I don't know if they've ever done it, so I've asked uh, Craig and Maggie to, to do the offering today. Thanks for helping, guys. Craig. Maggie. <laughs> Well, that is true. <laughs> okay. We give thee not thy own, whatever it may be. All that we have is silent alone, but your soul comfort from me. Where is that? Here? She she's been in the hospital. She's yeah, she's in a hospital. Yes. So Lynn Nucci's in the hospital. We did the first. There is Diane. Why don't you hang on to even up to the end of the hour for now? That's a very important place in the world. Okay. She has a brain that says a lot of nothing, but she will take you to her hospital. She's had a stroke. Kara Parnell is Diane's neighbor up at Beckham Hills. Anybody have a neighbor? 
when she had been in a, or she did end up in the hospital. I get that the miles go, but she's coming home to school. She's going home to school. So a lot, of, a lot of health issues. Bill Ward got home this week. It is correct. My mic was off. <laughs> See, I got to look every time because I, pr- I think I pressed the button, and if I don't press it hard enough, uh, Harry's mic's off. Thanks, Lisa. Good one. Um, so just, just to hear, I don't know if they heard that. So Lynn Ritchie's in hospital, those of you that are out on the Internet. And she actually asked to be on the prayer list. So, yeah. Um, and Bill Work, work is home. Um, Jean Tyler is in hospital. I, I, I saw her there. We had a wonderful chat. This is Jean Tyler Sr., who's the same age as my mom. She's only 97. She's older than Craig. <laughs> and uh, uh, we had this wonderful chat for a while, and her, her daughter works at the hospital, came in, and we were chat with her, and we realized that Jean, I had a mask on, because you have to have a mask on. She thought I was the doctor for after all. So <laughs> it, was, it was kind of funny. And she said, well, if you didn't have that mask, it wasn't that she wasn't, she's sharp as a tack, but. I had them, this mask on, we all, and they all look the same. Um, any others? Oh, sorry, Roberta. Oh. So this is a request for Barbara McComb, who is uh, Dan and Roberta's sister-in-law, and uh, she's having, she's had lung cancer, and she's having lungs, parts of lungs removed, in again in January. Okay. Thanks, Bart. Or thanks, uh, Roberta. That it? Weird. Let's pray. <coughs> Excuse me. Lord, our Lord, how excellent are your ways in all the earth. Lord, we worship you. We love you. We serve you. And Lord, you've called us as part of that service to be people of prayer and to bring our requests and our concerns before your throne. And so we do that with, with, uh, with hope, uh, with uh, expectation, Lord, and with trust in your great power to save and to intervene. Lord, so we lift these needs to you. We continue to be concerned about uh, uh, wars on, this, on two fronts, especially in, in other places in the world. We think of the, the one in Israel, the, the horrors there in, in Gaza, Lord, we think of what's been happening in Ukraine for going on almost two years. Uh, Lord, we pray for your peace to, to come, and that your help to, 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 to be with those who need comfort, those who need recovery. Lord, uh, such a mess. Lord, we, we, we lift them to you. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We pray for our, our society, our world, uh, as we continue to battle COVID, which comes back in its different forms. And Lord, we're concerned about our healthcare system here in, in Ontario and in Canada uh, and all those engaged in that. Lord, that you would be their help and strength and wisdom. Uh, Lord, we put that, that need in your, in your care. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love answer. Lord, we remember today Lynn Ritchie in hospital, uh, Jean Tyler, Tyler Sr., Carol Parnell, Bill Wark, Doug Stevenson, Steve Hasty, Georgia Shank and her family, Joan Ellis, Donna Roberts, and Charlie Hadley. Lord, hear our prayer in your love. Answer. We pray for Mar- Marie Singh, Don Tran, Linda and Stan, Rita Mona, Tiffany, Penny, Harry, Kelly Hutchings, Roger Davey, Mildred Hill. Lord, hear our prayer. And in your love, answer. We remember Angelo and Dorothy, Al, Steve Wiggins Sr., Timothy, Don Gentle, Heather Wilson, 
Graham Reed, and Kim Roberts. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We pray for Judy Grant, John and Millie Payne, Bonnie Jackson, Lois Rigney, Roy Riddell, Eleanor, Craig Nickel, Jane Johnson, and Brian Newstead. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. And we pray for Isabel Jolly, Victoria Ancaster, Paul, Ron Mark Jr., and others that we bring to you in the quiet of our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. For we pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I was going to mention, so we forgot last week, that uh, some people have done some, some lovely decorating of the tree. And I think it was Melissa and Janice, at least. Craig put up the tree, <laughs> and I'm not sure who else did, but thanks, guys. It looks great. And uh, um, there was something else I wanted to say, but now I've forgotten what it is. Okay, and call Leslie to read our scripture. Before we do that, the prayer of illumination is on the screen. Please read together. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Through Jesus our Lord. Amen. The scripture reading today is Mark 1, verses 1 to 8. When I was looking at this passage, I always think about um, what would we do if somebody told us that Jesus was coming back? Would we scoff? Would we believe? This is about John the Baptist who foretells the story. Are we so cynical and jaded that we might think, well, just another news story? The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all of the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing the sins, their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. May we have the heart to see. Thanks, Leslie. I remember what I was going to say. You probably already know this because most of you were at the meeting last week, but we did have a vote congregational vote to amalgamate with Inglesby, right? So that's, uh, that's uh, all systems go as far as I know. <coughs> um, I think we're going to sing a classic Advent hymn, Hark the Glad Sound, the Savior Comes.
<clears throat> I think Melissa's heading out. I got my guitar here just in time for the last hymn today. Safe travels, yeah. It's my car out of bed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Shall we pray? Lord, thank you for our time together today. We thank you for your word, which has been, been read aloud. And uh, Lord, may it work its way into our ears, our hearts, our minds, our ways, and our lives. Lord, as we consider what you have said and what you have presented to us, the truth that sets us free. Lord, pour your spirit upon us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, I never noticed this before the last few days, but a penitentiary, you know what that is, right? That's like a jail or a prison. <laughs> I never really thought before the, the root of the word penitentiary is penitence. <laughs> so it's a place for penitence. Did you ever think of the penitentiary as, as that? So, so somewhere in history, obviously, people had this idea that, that uh, you know, if you incarcerate someone, that'll give them a little pause for thought. <laughs> time, time apart from society, but it, with, with the hope and the expectation that there will be repentance, there will be penitence, and hence the name, the penitentiary. Never thought of that before, so I thought it was pretty clever. So I called the sermon today, which you don't know, Penitentiary Peace, <laughs> PP, and uh, uh, because... I'm try for years now, we, we come to the second Sunday in Advent, and it's always, the scripture's always the John the Baptist story, right? And it's all, and the candle is always the peace candle. So I was like, how do those two things go together? You know, John the Baptist and peace. But I think they do go together really, really well. Because to me, penitence is the background, repentance is, is where, where we get our peace from. So I would argue that the only real way to lasting peace in ourselves, in our hearts, in our relationships, in our world, is via penitence or repentance. I mean, peace is God's plan. Shalom, you know, when peace shall over all the earth, it's ancient splendors. I mean, God's plan was to have shalom, and it started out great. It's been broken because of sin. So in order for peace to get back, we have to undo the effects of sin. Or God, God has to do it. And this is... This is core to the Christian faith. I mean, basically, is it the Christian faith is not about, you know, a, a set of guidelines so we'll live better lives. Yeah, it's got, a, it's got that. But that's not what it is at core. At core, it's, it's God's solution to the human mess. This deep problem which each, each one of us uh, as human beings, you know, are, are subjected to or prone to. Uh, God has consigned all under sin that he might have mercy on us all. Um, <laughs> so to go back, to, just to get the connection again from, uh, from Paul's letter to the Romans. So Paul, Paul's letter to the Romans is kind of his biggest letter, his, the first letter we find as we go through the New Testament. And it's kind of a, a Christianity 101. Paul is explaining the real basics of the Christian faith in this letter. And the first few chapters are pretty tough. Basically, he just laying it out there that we are, uh, he sums it up as, you know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So in no, he doesn't spare details. And he says, you know, the Gentiles, they're really messed up, but not just them, <laughs> the Jews too. So, and then he just says, in the whole shebang, you know, we're, we're, we're broken. So by the time he gets to uh, chapter three, he quotes Old Testament stuff. And he, he, sling, he, he, uh, he, he puts a whole bunch of little verses together from the Old Testament, from the Psalms, from Isaiah. Uh, like this, their feet, humans, are swift to shed blood, ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So after he's kind of worked this theme quite, quite dutifully for several chapters, then he, he, he represents the gospel, you know, that, that through Christ, the, the, we're getting out of this predicament. Through Christ, there is, uh, there is forgiveness, there is reconciliation, there is, and his big word is, justification. 
And uh, so we're justified, in other words, considered righteous or right or just in the eyes of God through faith in Jesus Christ, not through our own works because our own works are too messed up. <laughs> and and they, they, don't, they, don't, uh, they don't merit that in, in God's sight. And he, he goes back to the Old Testament again. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness because he believed God, he trusted God. So when we get to the end of chapter 4, uh, he says, but all, this is 424, but also for us, for whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe, notice the word believe or trust in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So he's, he's kind of encompassed the gospel here. Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins. I mean, the, the centerpiece, the center symbol of the Christian faith is the cross of Christ. And the cross of Christ implies and sets before us regularly and steadily and constantly the reality of the sinfulness of, a human, of, of human beings. If there was no sin, the cross would not be necessary. I mean, we should have been, you know, pulled, pulled, just pulled up our bootstraps and got our act together. Except that we couldn't. And we can't. And so God has, uh, has brought us into his, you know, brought us back to his, himself, brought us back to his heart through the cross of Jesus. So, so but, but when we accept that, when we, when we trust in that, that is repentance. That's a change of thinking. That's a change of, uh, you know, of, of being, really. So after he says that, the next verse, the start of chapter 5, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified, made just, made righteous, through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's the peace angle. See, so once we're just, we've confessed, we've repented, we are justified by faith, then we have peace with God. And that's where all peace comes from. Peace has to start somewhere deep within. And the starting point for us is that we need to have peace with our God who made us for himself. That's our purpose in existing, <laughs> that we might be in relationship with God. We might be in a love relationship and then, and then learn to be in a love relationship with others. But it's got to start there. Peace with God. We have peace with God, then we have peace within, and then that starts to burble over onto our relationships with people and, into, and affect society. Right? <laughs> Let me have a drink of water. Now, these things have not changed. There's a, I, grew up, I grew up a churchgoer in the United Church in Minden, and some of you will remember this. Uh, it, I think it's called the Gloria or the... I'm not sure if it's the doxology or the Gloria. But I think it was at the, according to Valerie Griffin, who was at uh, the other two services, she claims that it was at the end of the service where we would sing, Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, <laughs> is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I love that line, as it was in the beginning. <laughs> and as a kid, I was, I was like, man, oh man. How cool is it to jam all those words together in that short little space? <laughs> it's, like, it's like eight syllables that are jammed into the space at two, as it was in the beginning. <laughs> as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. And it's just a simple truth. There, there are things, that, in the, the realities and truths that God about God and that God reveals to us in Scripture uh, from the beginning, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. There's some things that never change, which is pretty cool in this world where everything seems to change. All the outward things change. I mean, all the technology and the speed of life and the expectations and the culture, it's all shifting like shifting sand. This, this, this thing, God himself, he does not change. Uh, the, toward the end of the book of Hebrews, uh, we're told Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Rock solid, rock solid, no change. So <laughs> one of the things that's, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that thought in a sec, but uh, I find it interesting that how, how Mark starts his gospel. So Mark, Mark starts the gospel like this. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. That's his first verse. <laughs> and uh, Mark's gospel is the first 
generally conceded by scholars to be the very first written, the first gospel to be written. They believe that Mark, or Matthew and Luke drew on it quite a bit. So they're, they're parallel gospels. They're called synoptics, right? Right? That's a fancy academic word, which means they look the same. <laughs> synoptics. <clears throat> so uh, so Mark, Mark's first, and he, he just gallops along, like, He's almost abrupt in the way he presents things. He just gallops, gallops through the story of Jesus' ministry until he gets to the Passion Week, and then he puts the brakes on. And about a third of his little 16-chapter gospel, about a third of it is, has to do with the sufferings, the preparation for uh, Christ's uh, trial and his sufferings and his death. And he slows right down. All the gospels are like that. It's almost like that's the thing that they want to emphasize, because there's at least a third of each of the Gospels has to do with the sufferings and the death of Jesus. And then, you know, Paul, Paul just, you know, basically says straight out as he starts to raise, you know, I, I, I determined to know nothing about you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So the death of Christ, the sufferings of Christ are always central to, to the Christian faith. So even Mark in his gallop along, uh, that's where he's going. But <laughs> he starts it off by presenting, he's telling us exactly what he's going to tell us. You know, he's, he's basically, he's, 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 he's presenting to us that this is what I'm going to prove to you, this is what I'm going to present to you, this is what I'm going to show to you, uh, that is, that this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. He is the Messiah that was promised forever, and he is the Son of God. So the beginning. <laughs> so the beginning, he starts with, is the story of John the Baptist. And I, well, I, I, I puzzle over this. <laughs> year after year, I puzzle over this. <laughs> and I'm not sure I've got it yet. I've got some clues. And, you know, like, it seems to be a really big deal because all four Gospels start with the ministry of John the Baptist, who, as Lynn and I were chatting about this week, was Jesus' cousin. <laughs> we know that because their mothers were cousins. And if your mothers are cousins, then you're cousins too, right? All you genealogically minded people, yeah. You know what? Is it third cousin or second cousin twice removed? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so, so John is Jesus' cousin, older by about six months, and he starts his ministry or his, his, uh, his thing before Jesus. Now, what it appears to me is that John, one of the things here is that John is the link between the Old Testament and the New. Because John the Baptist is actually an Old Testament guy. Uh, he, he, he is a prophet of the old school. And in fact, you, you notice this description of him that Leslie read. Um, he wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey and hung out in the wilderness. He was a weird dude. <laughs> he was a strange guy. But you know what? This is almost the exact description of Elijah the prophet. That's why this description is here. And it's to tell us and give us a hint, if you know your Bible, <laughs> that, uh, you know, it, it, the, the, uh, the return of Elijah was promised in the Old Testament. And Jesus says, he was Elijah who was to come. Not that he's reincarnated, because the, the Bible never teaches that stuff, but that he, was, he came in the spirit of Elijah, one of the great prophets. And he did the prophet thing. In other words, he, he, he tore into the people about their sinfulness and, the, you know, their waywardness and their brokenness. <clears throat> and he was... The voice of one crying in the wilderness, <laughs> prepare ye the way of the Lord. Boy, I, sometimes I really resonate with that, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I don't <laughs> Try preaching. <laughs> and it, sometimes people seem to click in. I mean, you guys are guys perfect, attentive and understanding of everything. But not everybody is always like that. Plus, we're a very, very small minority in this great world. There's a few churches and a few preachers you know, we're presenting scripture, we're presenting Jesus, we're presenting the good news of the gospel. By and large, it's wilderness, right? It's, it's a strange thing, but it's, but it's God's choice. He does, he's been doing this for millennia. The prophets, the apostles, the church down through the centuries is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Now, <laughs> so his whole job is to prepare the way for Jesus. And what does that mean? How does he do that? It says, he, he began baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So the whole thing, the whole preparation thing was about them, about the populace, uh, you know, uh, repenting, turning away from sin and confessing, admitting their sins. And it was, a, you know, it was a strange event. Like John's down by the Jordan River. These people, a lot of these people are up in Jerusalem, which is, uh, I forget the geography exactly, but it's like uh, maybe a thousand feet below sea level when by the time you get down to the Jordan River. It's way down there. And, uh, and Jerusalem is hundreds of feet above sea level. So there's a big, steep, tough journey to go from Jerusalem down to the Jordan River. You hear about it in the story of the Good Samaritan, because the guy that, that falls among thieves, he's on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem. And it's a, and it's a scary, dangerous, tough road. <laughs> but all the people, I, I, I'm guessing this is hyperbole. Not every single last soul in Jerusalem went down to see John the Baptist. But a good chunk of people did. It was a movement. It was a revival. It was a strange phenomenon. And I'd say looking back, you know, from the, from in the early church, they looked back and they saw, ah, it was all preparatory for the coming of Jesus. And then they, you know, they, the Holy Spirit showed that to them and they, they wrote what they did. So what, what were they confessing? What were their sins? Hmm, we can only guess. So let's guess. <laughs> I mean, basically, these were people of the book, uh, Old Testament people that believed in the Moses Law, the Ten Commandments. So, I mean, right off the top, you know, you're not supposed to lie. Well, we lied. <laughs> we're not supposed to steal. Well, we steal. Stole. Uh, we're not supposed to commit adultery. Well, guess what? Uh, you know, whatever else. Maybe, you know, they were cheating people, uh, bullying people, all that kind of stuff. So that's, you know, basic stuff that we human beings do. I'm guessing they were admitting that. In the, in the Gospel of John, the parallel passage, uh, the, uh, the tax collectors come and they say to John, well, what should we do? Because <laughs> they're, they're, they're trying to make, make things right. And, and uh, John says, well, you should stop taking any more than you're supposed to take. <laughs> you know, just collect the taxes you're supposed to take. They were infamous, the tax collectors. That's why they're always the bad guys in, in, the, in the Gospels, right? Because they didn't just take what they were supposed to take, they topped it up for themselves. <laughs> so he says, don't do that anymore. Simple. And soldiers came, and he said, well, they say, well, what should we do? And he says, well, you know, uh, stop, uh, stop extorting money from people and stop accusing people of stuff they don't, they don't do. Can you imagine police doing stuff like that? Never, but maybe. <laughs> there's some, there's, some, there's some, some degree of history repeating itself, you'll notice. Uh, so still today, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. The preparation for Jesus to come and do his ministry was repentance, was, uh, was confession of sins. And I believe the same order applies. You or I or anybody, any human being, would be ready to know Jesus, to experience Jesus, to, to, to have God at work in their lives. Some kind of repentance is required. It's the preparatory work. It's God's work. And it might be as simple as thinking the thought, maybe I'm wrong. You know, people have a hard time thinking that thought. You know, we, we get so focused on, you know, and just self-justifying ourselves for every little thing we do and every little thing we think. You know, just to think the thought, oh, you know, maybe I am wrong about whatever. <laughs> Fill in the blank. I know I, I'm not going to go into details about it, but that was a big thing in my life some years ago. Somebody mentioned to me, you know, I think this is, your, this is a problem you got. And I would never, I was just, no. I thought, well, maybe they're right. And it changed my life. And, uh, you know, I, I've noticed that a lot of people are not inclined to ever think that they might be wrong about anything. <laughs> but that, and that's, so, so that's the start. God can work with that. God can work with that. Repentance isn't necessarily some great, big, dramatic thing, you know. Uh, some of us have the impression, and I think I had this impression growing up when I heard the repentance, it was a churchy word, because <laughs> nobody else ever said it, really, <laughs> that, you know, it required, it required a wailing and ripping of clothes and pulling on of sackcloth and ashes on the head and buckets of tears and, and you know, 
prostrating oneself on the floor. Is that required for repentance? <laughs> no. Most of the time, it's something just quiet that happens within. So we just reviewed that teaching in Philippians 4. Um, Josh read it, and Sharon and I have been talking about it. This very same verse it means a lot to a lot of us. You know, uh, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Guess what? If you practice that, you're repenting. <laughs> and all of us are anxious because we all deal with anxiety. Now, I, you're not, this is going to be offensive, but there's a way that anxiety has to do with sin. <laughs> like, w the reason we're anxious is because we care about things, and we care about people, and we care about our world and stuff like that. And we care about our, our you know, our own behavior and, and uh, and our own actions and things. And so the, the, the twist inside us is anxiety. It comes from a good, place, a good place, caring, but it's twisted by our mistrusting. Paul says, whatever is without faith is sin. Romans, whatever is without faith is sin. So when we stop trusting in God, then we, we are anxious. So in this, in this activity of letting our requests be made known to God and say, oh, I'm anxious about whatever. I, I, I was thinking about this last night. It was, I was getting ready to preach a sermon today. I get anxious, and I have to repent. <laughs> Lord, you know, I, I'm not trusting you with this. So Lord, I trust you with this. And that's and it's, it's a life, steady, everyday thing probably for all of us. If you, you're going to tell me that you don't struggle with anxiety, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm not sure I believe that. Because <laughs> I know I do, and I know others much more. Um, so it, it, the psalmist says, search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So it's connected. Now, the anxiety. Now, <laughs> and, look, and look, what's the result when, when we repent in that way? The peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It, it brings peace. Repentance brings peace. If we harbor a grudge or hatred against somebody, which we all tend to do, and then we come to the point where we say, oh, you know what? I'm just going to forgive them. because, it, And it's, some, it's not always easy. If it's a slight, it's easy. If it's a big life-changing thing where somebody's robbed you blind or damaged you or damaged your family member or whatever in some way, shape, or form, it can be pretty tough to forgive and let it go. But if you do, you have repented. And you will find peace. Because the only person, when we have grudges and stuff, the only person we're hurting is ourselves. We're killing ourselves. If we realize that we have a previously hidden to ourselves, that's one word here. It's kind of like, as it was in the beginning, this is a previously hidden to ourselves. <laughs> bias, if we have a previously hidden to ourselves bias against some people group, and we come to a realization of that, right? And we all probably do. I think, you know, we it just, we, we grow up with it, we hear it from home, we, we absorb it through our culture, uh, you know, a lot of us grew up with all kinds of things that we now understand that are racist epithets and, and little sayings. Uh, you know, so, so the bias against whatever people group that might be, it might be, it might be the people that, that are in penitentiaries. You might have a bias against cons, convicts. You might disdain them as lesser people, lesser beings. It might, or it might be Russians, or it might be Asians, or it might be blacks, or it might be Jews, or it might be, indi you know, indigenous people. Um, it might be people of the opposite sex. It might be people with less education. It might be uh, people with less money. We have this, this crazy way of having a bias against people who are not us <laughs> or like us. And if we recognize that, that's repentance. We recognize that it's repentance. Um, I, I'm, I was reading Broadview. Do you know, anybody know what Broadview is magazine? It's the United Church magazine, by the way. <laughs> Very sad that you don't know. It used to be called The Observer. They changed the name to Broadview. 
And, and they have a lot of articles about this kind of stuff, about biases against people groups, indigenous groups, the sexism, uh, racism, uh, all the time, you know, kind of calling us out on this stuff. And uh, this month, there's one on ageism, I don't know, so, which is, is really well done, really well written. But they're pointing out that our society, our culture, uh, it has a, quite a bit of a bias against the elderly as they get el older. Not that any of us are in that category. <laughs> Except for Craig, sorry. You know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, our, since, since like the Industrial Revolution time, when we, the, the thing that has been valued is high speed and high productivity and, and usefulness, you know, once you get to a certain age and that's not happening, Let's just get them out of sight here somewhere and put them in long-term care. I mean, that's not entirely true. But there's a tendency uh, for us to do this. And before that time, people, to a much greater extent, had valued the elderly. You know, people were, were respected and they were honored and they were understood to have more wisdom than the rest of us. And, uh, uh, you know, now that some of us are aging, we, we'd like to get that back again. <laughs> But, but there has been a bias against that. So, so it, true. Um, but we can inform people of these kinds of isms, and we can educate people about them, and we do, and, you know, the broad view is big on that. And we can change our language and, you know, do, use our language better to, to be more inclusive and all that kind of stuff. And that it's helpful. I'm not saying it isn't. There's, there's a usefulness to it. But at the end of the day, it's kind of superficial. Because people need transformed hearts, transformed hearts, transformed minds, transformed attitudes. And that's what Christianity is all about. That's what, who we are. We are people who are having, having our inner works transformed and changed. And so, so hopefully, if we are Christians, and most of you have walked with Jesus and uh, been Christians for a while, and you've worked through all this stuff that I'm talking about today. To, to, I, know, I know that you're, you're sitting there thinking, tell us something we don't know, Harry. You know? <laughs> because, because basically this is old hat to you. It's, it's just as obvious as the nose on your face. And it is. It is for us. It's our privilege in Christ. We stand under the cross. We live in forgiveness. We're blanketed by mercy. You know, we are new creatures, and this is this amazing privilege. So, so because, because of that, we can live lives in the light. We can live lives in honesty. We know that though there be sin within, it taint who we are anymore. We are new creations in Christ. We have the nature of Christ now flowing through us and defining us. We can live lives like that. But this is why the gospel must go forth, why church matters today. Why people need the, need the cross and they need Jesus Christ and they need transformation. People can't change themselves. God alone transforms hearts and therefore brings peace. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are transforming our hearts. And as that happens, we, we know and experience more and more peace even in troubled times and in trouble, a troubled world. Lord, we pray that your truth would go forth. Lord, you would grant to the hearts of more and more folks the grace of penitence, of repentance, that we might humble ourselves before Almighty God and know the grace that flows from your cross. Lord, teach us, help us, and Lord, that we may not only experience your peace, but share it with the world around us. Lord, with our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors, our friends, from country to country, Lord, <clears throat> you who are the Prince of Peace, and we ask it in your name. Jesus, you who taught us in prayer to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Okay, we're going to sing uh, Angels We Have Heard on High. Make sure I've got the mic turned off now. And then I'll turn it back on with the microphones. Let's do it in the key of B. <coughs> And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us, both now and always. Amen. We'll just sing this one a cappella. Go, 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 go. Let's get it. Go now in peace, never be our